So we have um, several things. I'm just going to sort of summarize them right quick. We have density. You know, that's that uh, the density is mass over volume. And all these equations are on your equation sheet. I'll just sort of summarize it now, and then we'll look at some example problems on how these things, how I test you on these, sort of your knowledge of things. Uh, we also have elasticity. That says that if you apply a stress to a to a material, that you will um, you'll have it'll cause a deformation in the material. So uh, the stress is force per unit area, and that's equal to the Young's modulus times some change in length over the initial length. So again, if I have something, I apply a force per unit area to it. It deforms that material. It stretches it or compresses it, as it may be, and um, we can find the amount that it stretches by that. Uh, we have sort of basic definition of pressure. We have pressure is force over unit area. We had some things here for units. This is uh, newtons per square meter, which is one pascal. And then you also need to know that a pascal, or rather uh, one atmosphere, is one times 10 to the fifth pascals. Uh, although that's on your equation sheet. We, and then we have pressure at a certain depth. So if I have a container, at some point in the container, uh, a distance h from the top, the pressure at that point is equal to p naught plus rho g h. So that's how I calculate the pressure in a liquid, in a fluid, a uh, certain depth. P naught is the pressure that's pushing down on the surface of this liquid. Um, then we also have pressure measurements. This is very similar to what we did with this, uh, with this part. Pressure measurements. I have a tube that's either open or not open. I have one pressure that's pushing here. I'll call this P naught. That'll be our known pressure. I have another pressure that's pushing over here. We'll call that P. That's your unknown. And P is equal to P naught plus or minus rho G H. So in this tube, you'll have a liquid. That'll be at different levels. If they're at the same level, then the two pressures are equal. If they're not at the same level, then these two pressures are going to be different. In this case, this pressure over here is bigger or smaller than this pressure? This is a bigger pressure. It's pushing that fluid down and pushing it back up on this side. So this pressure P is bigger than this pressure P naught. So here we're going to use the positive because P is bigger than P naught. So P is P naught plus this term, this rho G H. And this height that we're dealing with is the height here the height h. Okay, so those are pressure measurements. We'll really get some problems here in just a few minutes. Um, and then also Pascal's principle. Pascal's principle is the principle behind hydraulic lifts. And Pascal's principle just says that the pressure in a fluid is the same at all points. I'll just write it as P1 equals P2. So if I have a lift, like a hydraulic lift, maybe a figure like this in the, in the book. Um, if I have a force, F1, over an area, A1, uh, I get a force out over here, F2, over an area, A2. But because I have a difference in the areas, these two pressures are equal, but the forces are not equal. Okay, so if I put in a, a little force here, a little force over a little area, I get a big force over a big area. So that's, you know, that's the concept behind hydraulic lifts, like in a shop, or a jack, a hydraulic jack that you use out on the road or whatever. Uh, it allows you to get a big force from a little force. So that's uh, Pascal's principle. If you're in the in-class section, we've gotten up to that point. Uh, Archimedes' principle, which if you're in the lab, you did this in the lab. Archimedes' principle says that the buoyant force This is probably the most difficult topic in this in this chapter. The 
buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. So if I have an object that is within a liquid, it displaces a certain volume of liquid. The volume of liquid that it displaces is equal to the volume of the object. Let me write that down. Volume of the displaced fluid equals the volume of the object. Right, that's a nice way to measure the volume of irregular objects. You just measure the volume of the displaced fluid. You probably did that in high school. You put an object in the uh, graduated cylinder and see what the change in the level of water is. No, 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 no. Okay. All right, so anyway, I can find the volume of an object by looking at the volume of the displaced fluid. Now, the weight of the displaced fluid then is the same as the volume of the object. So I can say that the weight of the displaced fluid is rho of the fluid times the volume of the object times g. This is just the same as saying the mass of the displaced fluid times g. Because when I multiply density times volume, the density of the fluid times the volume of the displaced fluid, this is the mass of the displaced fluid. But since the volume of the displaced fluid is equal to the volume of the object, then I can just put in the volume of the object here, because I know that. That's what the way I do. All right, so this is equal to uh, the buoyant force. So anytime I have an object that's completely submerged or even partially submerged, the buoyant force that pushes up is going to be equal to this. Okay? You can have some cases where the object is not fully submerged. Okay, this is... Uh, well, this mass of the fluid is equal to this term. I'm sorry, this is actually, this rho Vg is actually the expression for the buoyant force, but uh, that rho times V gives us the mass of the fluid, or I should have written M times G above that. And then the mass of the fluid is the density times the volume. Oh, and G is spin. G is the acceleration due to gravity. Well, don't worry, I'm sort of throwing this all out at you, but we'll come back and work some problems with it to put it in the application. In fact, let's we'll stop right there uh, on Archimedes, and I'll come back to it. There were two other things, Arc, uh, equation of continuity and Bernoulli's equation. These have to do with the flow of ideal fluids. An ideal fluid, you have several criteria for an ideal fluid. It can't be viscous. It's a non-viscous fluid. Make sure you know what these are. I'll write them down. Ideal fluid is non-viscous. That means it's, you know, it's not thick. It's not like syrup or whatever. Viscosity tells how thick it is. So something like water, for example, is non-viscous. It's incompressible. So that, that basically means no gases, because gases are all compressible. Uh, it has steady motion. That means at a point, at a particular point in the fluid, or in the liquid in this case, V is constant. Right. Um, and it's irrotational. Right, so no circular motion. If you have, say, water moving in a pipe, that's a pretty much an ideal fluid. These are all ideal fluid characteristics. And if you have an ideal fluid, then these two ideas will, will, will hold for it. The first is the equation of continuity. The equation of continuity. I know this is very fast, but like I said, we'll come back and revisit all this. Equation of continuity is based on the conservation of matter. Conservation of matter says that you can't destroy or create matter. That uh, you know you can change its phase or form or whatever, but you can't destroy it completely. So it's based on the conservation of matter. It says that if I have uh, 
say, for example, I have a pipe that gets bigger, like this. Uh, I have an area down here, A1. I have a certain velocity, V1. Down here, I have an area, A2. And I have a certain velocity, V2. And what the equation of continuity says is that the product of these is constant. A1, V1 equals A2, V2. If you think about the units of this, this is uh, meters cubed per second. This area is meters squared. This is meters per second. So this is a volume flow rate. It says that a certain volume of fluid is going through this pipe in a particular amount of time. Uh, it's a volume flow rate. It's a lot like our velocity that we dealt with in the first couple of chapters. But here, instead of talking about uh, meters per second, we're talking about cubic meters per second. How many cubic meters per second will flow through this pipe in a given time? Um, and so what this says is that whatever my volume flow rate is here has to be the same here. Otherwise, like if we have a lower volume flow rate here, then that means that you're getting stuff backed up over here. It's stopping for some reason. Right, so these have to be equal by this equation of continuity, assuming that we have an ideal flow. Uh, and so, for example, here with the bigger pipe, V2 would be bigger or smaller? It's going to be smaller. V2 will be a bit smaller because uh, if A2 goes up, as it does here, V2 has to go down. That's called the equation of continuity. It's based on the conservation of matter. And if your area gets bigger, your speed goes down. If your area gets smaller, your speed goes up. Okay? The next one, which is related, is called Bernoulli's equation. And in contrast, this is based on the conservation of energy. We'll go through this in the class, or you'll see it online, uh, where how it's derived from the conservation of energy. But just know for now that it's based on the conservation of energy. And it says this, that for a ideal fluid, the pressure at a given point plus one-half rho v squared at that same point plus rho g h at that same point is equal to a constant value. All right, so this is actually a measure of the energy per volume. In a liquid, and Bernoulli's equation says that if, if your fluid has this energy per unit volume, then that has to always remain the same. Mostly, we'll deal with cases that are at constant height. I think in your homework, you have one problem where it changes height. But at constant height, where this remains constant, what we're saying then is that T1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared equals T2 plus 1 half rho V2 squared. So what that says is that if the velocity increases, the pressure does what? If these are constant, this whole thing is constant and it remains constant over here, if V1 goes up, what has to, or V1, or V2 rather goes up, what has to, have to happen to P in order for this to remain a constant value? It's going to increase or decrease. Uh, if V2, if this thing over here on the right is constant, it doesn't change. If V2 goes up, what has to happen to P2? It goes down, right. That's the pressure has to go down. So a good example of this is like your water hose. When you put your thumb over the, uh, the end of your water hose, you get a higher velocity of fluid that comes out of your water hose. That goes back to that equation of continuity because I'm decreasing the area, increasing the speed. But if I increase the speed, that means my pressure decreases. So that's a good application of that. In fact, we'll see in the class that uh, in if you have like a, an artery or whatever that gets blocked, partially blocked, then you'll get a much higher speed of blood inside that artery, and you also get a locally a lower pressure at that point. 
because of the Bernoulli's equation. Uh, be able to apply this. We'll see. We'll look at some old texts. There are some problems with that. All right. That's it. Like I said, a lot of different topics in this chapter. Uh, and some of them, they're loosely related. They all have to do with fluids, except for the elasticity, which has to do with a solid. But it's really just sort of a hodgepodge of stuff. Let's look at some problems. Is that okay? Are you all have questions for Patilli? Okay, let's take a look at some problems then. Um, Y'all have F13, Paul 13 is actually a book, is that right? Or do you have Paul 14? Yeah, 13. Okay, let's look then at Paul 14. Um, okay, so let's look at 26 here first. So we'll, we'll do a little bit of pressure measurements. Do a couple of pressure measurement problems. Consider this manometer. know the, the relationship between P and P naught. In this case, is P bigger than or smaller than this pressure? Is this the bigger or the smaller pressure? This one's smaller. So this goes back to that pressure measurement. So if I wanted to calculate P, I would say that P is equal to P naught minus rho GH, where H is this distance right here. Okay? Because P naught is the higher level, it's going to be smaller, so P is less than P naught in this case. Now we have a special case, this is called a manometer. We have a special case of a manometer, which is called a barometer, right here. Uh, I have this barometer, it's filled with water, and I want to know the height when the pressure is 0.2 atmospheres. So a couple things we need to recognize. First, I know that P is equal to P naught plus rho times G times H. I want to know what P is right here. Uh, I recognize that this is a barometer, which is a special case where P naught is equal to zero. So I can get rid of that P naught. And now I'm just calculating my um, my P. Now, oh, actually, no, I'm looking for the height. So P is 0.2 atmospheres, rho GH. But if you solve this for H using these values, you'll find that you get an answer that's there, but that's incorrect, because you need to make sure that your pressure is always in SI units. So one atmosphere is one times 10 to the fifth pascals. So this is 0.2 times 10 to the fifth pascals. And then that's equal to rho. The uh, density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Now, all these values, the conversion between atmospheres to pascals and the densities of various fluids, those are on your equation sheet. But just make sure that you're familiar with it. Uh, G is the acceleration due to gravity. And then H is what you're solving for. So we have 0.2 times 10 to the fifth. That's what? 2,000? 20,000? Uh, over 10,000. So that's what? meters, right? If you ever have any question, just use Pascal's because uh, it's, well, no. If you're using this, you need to use the SI units because I would, I would look at this and I'd say, well, gosh, this is kilograms per cubic meter, meter second squared, meters. These are all SI units. So over here, my result is going to be in SI units. So any time you, you have a pressure in atmospheres, you're almost certainly going to have to convert it to, uh, to pascals. Now, you might need to convert it back to, you might have to convert something back to atmospheres, but you'll need to look at the units of the uh, thing. Right, yeah. When in doubt, always go to your SI units. So uh, we do our, you know, if I have 0.2 atmospheres, 
I use my unit conversion, so I have one atmosphere is one times 10 to the fifth. I sort of glossed over that, but that's that's how you do that. And then your unit cancel out, right? Yeah, Jeremy? Then, like, if I had 0.2 times 10 to the fifth pascals, yeah, I would say one atmosphere is one times 10 to the fifth pascals. And then those would cancel. All right. It's always good to sort of revisit that. Um, all right, let's, I think that's pressure measurement. Let's find that. What now? It's easy when you see somebody else doing it, but, you know, as y'all know, uh, y'all know, you have to really make sure that you can sit down. 21. 21 is not that bad. So this is a, um, right, the Young's modulus, the elasticity. So we're going to do this one. I said a lot of these, it's just sort of knowing your units and knowing how to plug things into the right equation. You have all the equations there, so don't worry about memorizing them. But uh, just make sure that you're you're sort of familiar with them. You know, a couple times, two or three times going through until you make sure that you've got it down cold. All right, so a tenon in your arm without any pressure on it has a length of 0.1 meters. I have its cross-sectional area. I want to know how much does it stretch when I have a force of 100 newtons. So I'll know that this is an elasticity problem because it's the only solid that we have in the, in the chapter. Uh, and then I also... Well, I give you the Young's modulus here, but I'm probably not going to do that on this test because I give you a table with all the Young's moduli on them uh, on that equation sheet. But I know that force over area is the Young's modulus delta L over L. And then I want to look at it and see, oh my gosh, what am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for how much does it stretch. So what is that? Is that L or delta L? How much does it stretch? That's going to be my delta L. That's my change in length. So I'm looking for delta L. So however you want to do this, I'll go and solve this for delta L. F over A times L over Y. I just multiply both sides by L over Y. And then I have, I'm putting in numbers now, I have 100 newtons over the area, which is 7.5 times 10 to the minus 5 square meters times length, which is 0.1 meters over the Young's modulus, which is 2 times 10 to the 7 pascals. Solve that. 10 over... I think it's D. I'm not sure of that. Whatever that is. Okay. The only thing here is make, make sure that you're using SI units throughout. So here I actually gave the area in square centimeters, and then over here I gave it in square meters. But make sure that you can convert between those units. I haven't made the test out, obviously, but I, I would expect you to be able to convert centimeters squared to meters squared. Uh, what is this value? Did you get it? Wait, what was the answer when you put this in? Point zero, point zero zero in meters. I get point zero zero seven. I get point zero zero seven, but that's in meters. I'm looking for it in centimeters, so it's going to be D is the right answer. Watch your units, okay? Make sure that you use SI units, but then recognize that we're looking at centimeters here, 
So I have to convert this to centimeters. In order to convert it to centimeters, I go two places over. Yeah, well, never go wrong with SI units, but check your units of your answers as well. You know, sometimes it's more reasonable to express a number in centimeters than it is in meters. So that, that's why the options are there in centimeters. Okay. Um, again, not a difficult problem, but lots of places for you to go wrong in that problem. Making sure that you get all the numbers right. And uh, yeah, it should be, is it not? You're right, it's not. That's the buoyant force right here. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, it's just instead of saying volume of the object, it says volume of the displaced fluid. But those two are equivalent. Let me make a note to myself to, uh, I'll add that. It actually is on there, but it's in words. That stress equals modulus times strain. Um, but I'll add it in equation form. All right. Okay. Can I clear this, y'all? I feel okay with that? Let's look at, let's see what else we got here. Pascal's principle. Which of these is Pascal's principle? See that? Is it A, B, C, or D? You know, Pascal's principle has to do with uh, you know, the buoyant force is Archimedes' principle. Remember Archimedes' principle? He was the one that was in the tub or whatever, and he yelled Eureka because he had a way to determine the density of the crown or something to see if it was gold. That was Archimedes' principle, supposedly, that he came up with. What is it? D is right, yeah. So Pascal's principle is D. Let's see if there's a problem for Pascal's principle. I'm sure there is. Oh, yeah, right here. So this figure shows a hydraulic lift. But that problem came right after a good Pascal principle problem showed up. Um, here I have two different areas. This area is 0 0.01 square meters. This force is 100 newtons. Uh, this area over here is 1 square meter. And I want to know what is the weight of the truck. So what is F2? So I say F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2, you with me? Uh, and then I solve for F2, so F2 is F1 over A1 times A2. It's 100, over 0.01, so 100 over 1 over 100, that's 10,000, uh, times 1. So the answer should be D. That is 10,000, right? Yeah, because um, yeah, 100 times 100 is 10,000. Yeah, so it's 10,000 newtons. Okay? It's going to be like that. Like I could ask you for something else. Like I could ask you, give you some other value, ask for the area or ask for the input force, but it's going to look like that. There's not very much to do with that. That's similar to that. Seriously? Let me pull it up. Chapter 10, right? What is this? Okay, well, on this one, 
you have to find the areas of the two sides. So the areas, little a is going to be, uh, this is the diameter in centimeters. So little a is going to be pi times 3.8 over 2 squared. And big A is going to be pi times 53 over 2 squared. Well, it turns out you don't even really have to use pi because they cancel out, right? And in fact, notice here that I didn't convert my units. If you want to convert your units, that's fine. I said you're never going to go wrong going to the SI units, but in this case you don't have to because the units all cancel out in the end. And so here I'm going to have little f over little a, this force over this area, equals big F over big A. And I'm solving for our little f, which is going to be big F over A times little a is 20 kilonewtons times if I put these two over one another, it just comes out to be 3.8 squared over 53 squared. See how I did that? I canceled some things. I divided these two, canceled the pies, canceled the two squares, and uh, I'm left with 3.8 squared over 53 squared. I'm not sure what you were doing, but it's a similar problem to what we had with that other. Yeah, you know, that's what's going to get you on this test. But just make sure that you go through each type of problem. There's eight or nine different types of problems. Uh, not even that many. Seven, six to eight different types of problems in all those different categories. And uh, take a look at them. They're not going to change much from what we see on the, the old test. Okay? Is that okay? Oh, the pi is the, uh, it's a piston, and it has the cross-sectional area. But here, instead of giving you the actual area, I give you the diameter. It's a circle. That's pi r squared. Uh, you might need to know the area of a circle, pi r squared. But I try not to put too many needless busy work on the test, because I know that you don't have much time anyway. Yeah, I try not to put too many changing of units and sort of calculating of areas and stuff like that, but sometimes you might need to do it. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, this is a good density problem, number 18. You'll probably have just a basic density problem. Well, let's see, we have chapters 8, 9, and 10, so you're going to have... Uh, Probably about eight questions, yeah. So you'll probably have one, about one question from each topic and then some calculations and some conceptual things. So yeah, you could have one like this. Um, I have the mass. I want to know how many cubic meters. That's my volume. And I know that density is mass over volume. Notice that the density isn't given here, but since it's talking about volume in cubic meters and mass, then it should ding, it should, a little bell should go off reminding you that this is density. Uh, the density of water is 1,000. That's on your equation sheet in that little table. Is the mass, which is 300 kilograms, over the volume. So my volume then is 300 over 1,000, or 0.3 cubic meters. So A is the right answer. Hopefully that's a gimme, because you've been exposed, I'm sure, to density before. but Give me the mass, give me the volume, what's the density, or some other variation of that. But as you know, in a test, really no question is a gimme, because you can just make a small mistake and be off by a factor of 10. Next for this? Okay. Um, we did those. Okay, here's one on, on uh, Archimedes' principle. Listen, without when we get into buoyant forces and stuff, you're going to see on the concept test that some of the questions talk about, well, uh, well, never mind. No, those are good questions. We should, we should consider them as well. Never mind what I just said. Okay? But this is a, a basic Archimedes principle. I have a ping pong ball. Uh, I give the volume and the density here. And I want to know what is the buoyant force acting upon it. So 
this is my ping pong ball. Uh, I know that the buoyant force is the density of the fluid times the volume of the object times the acceleration due to gravity. Turns out I don't really need to know the density of it. Uh, I can find the buoyant force is 6,000, that's density of water. Volume of the object is 3 times 10 to the minus 5 cubic meters times g, which is 10. And so that's going to be 3, right? 3 newtons. But the buoyant force acting on this thing it has a, a magnitude of 3 newtons. By the way, there has to be another force acting on this too, right? A ping pong ball, if you want it to go underwater, what do you have to do? You have to push it down. And we can see that here because the density is only 84 kilograms per cubic meter. If an object has a density that's less than that of water, then it's going to float. We could figure out how much of it's going to float. Let's imagine that I have a ping pong ball that has that density, 84 kilograms per cubic meter. Or is this going to be too complicated? No, I don't think so. Uh, this thing is going to float. Let's say that it has a mass of uh, .1 kilograms. It's a heavy ping pong ball, a 100 gram ping pong ball. Now, if it has a mass of 0.1 kilograms uh, and it's sitting here, I want to know what volume is submerged. Okay? That means I want to know what is this volume, what fraction of this volume is submerged. Go with me on this? Okay. This is probably one of the more complicated problems, but it sort of harkens back to what we've done before. So you could see something like this. If I have a, a 1.1 kilogram object uh, that has a density of 84 kilograms per cubic meter, going with the ping pong ball, and I want to know how much it is submerged. Well, I know that I have two forces acting on this. I have the weight of the object, and I have the... Uh, buoyant force. And then in order for this to be in equilibrium, that these two forces have to be equal. That the buoyant force has to equal the weight. We're good on that? In order for this thing to not be zooming up in the air or flying down under the water, the buoyant force has to equal the weight. Uh, so the weight here is 0.1 kilogram times 10 meters per second squared, so it's m times g. The buoyant force is the density of the water times the volume of the object times g. These g's will cancel here and here, and the volume of the object will equal to uh, 0.1 kilograms. divided by the density of the water. So that's going to be 0 0.1 over 1,000, 0 0.0001 cubic meters. I know that you would tend to put 84 here, but with, because that's the density that we have up here, right? But this is the density of the object, not of the fluid. So whenever you're calculating the buoyant force, you always use the density of the fluid. Because remember, Archimedes' principle says that the buoyant force is the weight of the displaced fluid. It doesn't have anything to do with the object, the weight of the object. The buoyant force has to do with the weight of the displaced fluid. So be careful with this because students will often mess this up. That you want to use the density of the fluid here in order to find the volume of the object. Let me fix that on your equation sheet, because on your equation sheet, it actually, it's not incorrect, but it's going to confuse some students, because on the equation sheet, it says the density, what does it say? The volume of the fluid. It says the density of the fluid, the volume of the fluid, but I'll fix that. So, it's, like I said, it's not really fixing, I'll just make it more clear. 
I know it's it's a little bit confusing. A student, this Archimedes is probably the most difficult topic in this chapter. Um, what they're gonna do. So if I wanted to know the fraction of the object that was submerged, like with the ping pong ball, just a little bit of it's going to be submerged. Uh, that's the volume that's submerged. So that is this volume right here. I can also find the actual volume of this ping pong ball. The actual volume, the whole volume, is, uh, let's see, density is mass over volume. So volume is mass over density. Let's say 0.1 over 84. That's point zero zero one. So I have one tenth of my ping pong ball that's that's submerged. Follow me a little bit. If not, that's okay. I mean, we'll see this in class, and and it'll have a little time to sink in. But this is the whole volume of the ping pong ball. This is the amount of the ping pong ball that's actually submerged. Let me recap how I got this. So I said that the buoyant force of the ping pong ball is equal to the weight right here because it's in equilibrium. The buoyant force is this density of the fluid, volume of the object times G. The weight is the mass of the object times G. Cancel my Gs out. Solve for volume of the object. This isn't the whole volume of the object. It's just the submerged portion of the object. And I get this. Taking the mass over the density of water, this is the submerged volume of the object, the shaded portion right here. And then the whole volume of the object is this. It's the mass divided by the density, sort of as we did before. The whole volume is 0 .001, but only 0 .0001 is submerged. So only one-tenth of this object is submerged. Okay. I know, yeah, pe that's where people get confused with the densities. Okay, can I clear this? Don't sweat if you're not getting it right now. We have a couple weeks before the test to get it. I'll be okay. Um, all right, let's do this. Number 27, we'll wrap up with uh, fluid flow. This is, has to do with fluid flow. So I know it's either Cartesian or continuity or Bernoulli's principle. Okay, but when I look at it, I don't see any mention of pressure. So Bernoulli's principle is going to go out. So Bernoulli's principle will deal with the pressure of the fluid because the pressure will change. Here I'm just asking for the speed of the water. It goes from a 0.5 square meter pipe to a 1 square meter pipe. So my area will double. Is the, pre is the uh, velocity going to go up or down, the speed of this fluid? You go from a small pipe to a big pipe. Go up or down, the speed. It'll go down, right. Uh, and so I'm going from 0.5 to 1 square meter, then 3 meters per second. It's going to go down, so that gets rid of A and B. What's it going to be, B or C, you think? Think about it. I'll draw a picture while you're thinking. Right, so I'm going from small pipe, big pipe. Here the area, 0.5 square meters. Right here, the area is one square meter. Here, the speed is three meters per second. And now I want to know what is the speed here. I know that the speed is less than three. So that gets rid of that and that. But how much does it decrease? Does it decrease by a factor of three, or does it decrease by a factor of two? It decreases by a factor of two. So what's the answer then? 1.5, that's right. Uh, so 1.5 is right. Um, you, if you're not sure about that relationship, you just put in the numbers. Okay, so you say the area is 0 0.5 times 3 equals 1 times z. 0 0.5 times 3 is 1.5 equals 1 times 1.5. Right, and then if that, that works out. That's not going to lie to you either. But make sure that you're sort of checking and make sure that the numbers make sense. Because if I'm going to a bigger pipe, the speed has to go down by the equation of continuity. Uh, and because the pipe gets twice as big, the speed gets twice as small. It goes down by a factor of two. Okay. 
All right. And one more. Can I clear this? I might not have a renewy principle here. Okay, yeah, this is a good question. The homework can be a good guide for you for the test. Make sure you go through that homework. I know sometimes you're sort of don't do the homework, but it, it's a good thing to do because sometimes the test questions are straight from the homework. Okay, uh, this is both equation of continuity and Bernoulli's principle. So I have two horizontal sections. In the first section, the area is 10. In the second section, the area is 2.5. So I'm going from a big pipe to a little pipe. It's actually getting smaller by a factor of four. Here it's 10 centimeters squared, and here it's 2.5 centimeters squared. And now I want to know the flow speed. Over here it's 275 centimeters per second. And so over here I want to know what is V. Well, equation of continuity. Or, uh, 10 times 275, that's A1 times V1, is equal to 2.5 times our new V. So it's going to be four times as big, so 800, or 1100, 1100 centimeters per second. We'll just leave it in centimeters per second. Uh, so that's V. Actually, no, I'm going to go ahead and convert it to meters per second. So that's 11 meters per second. Now the second part of this has to do with Bernoulli's principle to find the pressure. If you see pressure with a flowing fluid, think Bernoulli's principle. That's really the only equation that you have that has pressure in it. Uh, Bernoulli's principle says that P1 plus one-half rho v1 squared equals p2 plus one-half rho v2 squared. I'm leaving off, you also had another part to Bernoulli's principle, uh, rho gh, but I'm leaving that off because notice that h1 is equal to H2. So those two will cancel out. And that's going to be the way it is on your test. I'll, I'll just, you won't change pipe. We'll just look at, we'll look at pipes that are all at the same height. Um, it makes the math a little easier. And then here I would solve for the pressure P2. Is it okay to not go through that? I'll just put in the numbers here because I know P1 is this 1.2 times 10 to the fifth pascals. I know the density is given somewhere. Here's the density. So your units are all messed up here, okay? On the test, I'll make sure you have, you don't have to do this many unit conversions, but this needs to be in kilograms per cubic meter. Although, that should be a pretty easy conversion, you know, because we know the density of water is one gram per cubic centimeter, and it's 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So this is gonna be 1,650 kilograms per cubic meter. See how it reason that out? Okay, so 1650. Um, so that's my density. And now I know my, my speed is 2.75 meters per second. And then you're solving for P2. You could see a problem like that. I said the units won't be all funky like this. I'll give you all more standard units. Yeah. I don't want you to. Huh? Okay. That's it for the uh, chapter 9. We are going to have chapter 10, but you know what, chapter 10, it's easy. It's like temperature scales, which y'all all know all about. It's ideal gas law, which you had in chemistry, I'm sure, PV over T, that thing. A mole, what's a mole? And it's all downhill from here. Okay? Good news, right? Okay. Good for that? Any? Okay, good. We're coming out, I know.